what a weekend of boxing what's going on everybody let's get into it let's recap some of the stuff that we saw this weekend there was a lot of fights happening so i personally did not catch all of them but the ones that i did let's discuss them where do we start man where do we start let's start with um let's start with jahai tucker and francisco veron what do you guys think about that fight man i thought it was a very good fight and a big step up for Jahai Tucker coming off of a loss. It really, really showed the type of competitor that he is to take a tough fight like Francisco Veron. And to be quite honest, man, a draw, he needed those last two rounds to get that draw because he was losing this fight. And I'm a Jahai Tucker guy, right? But I'm not a biased guy at the same time. So he needed those last two rounds to get the draw. And even then, I thought it was a little bit generous because Tucker, man, Varon was coming on, applying the pressure. Man, he's slick inside the ring too, man. He was getting shots in that you didn't think he could really get in, right? So he's a lot more tactical in his approach, you know, a lot more fluid in how he's maneuvering inside that ring, man. I thought he brought the pressure. I thought Jahai Tucker, there are moments where he was fighting off the back foot too much, moments where he was standing in front of the pocket too much, not moving his head, moments when he would find himself against the ropes. I'm like, bro, what are you doing? Get off the, get off the ropes. <laughs> get off the ropes. Like this guy is going to impose his will on you if you stay on the ropes. But the one thing that I like about Jahai Tucker, man, in that fight, in all of his fights, is this is a guy who is going to give it every single thing that he's got. This is a guy who is going to give it every single thing that he's got. He's not a guy who's going to be intimidated. He's not a guy who's looking to take the easy way out. He's not a guy who was looking to sit down, even if the fight isn't going his way. I thought he did a great job of getting locked in, especially those last two rounds. He got hit cleanly. He hit Varon cleanly at times, but for the most part, man, I thought Francisco Varon fought a great fight and a draw is generous because I thought that Varon won the fight in my eyes, right? Now, the last two rounds, I gave it to Jahai Tucker because he needed those last two rounds, but for the most part, man, he was getting outworked. He just wasn't doing enough, but when he was on the offense, when he did decide to throw the hands, he was able to have some good success and he was able to win those rounds. This is a fight that I wouldn't even mind seeing a rematch, man. I thought it was a good fight, and honestly... I thought top rank, man, they trying to get Jahai out of there, man. I'm not a conspiracy theory type of guy. If you've been watching the channel, we don't even really talk news like that. But man, to take this tough of a fight when you already have a loss on your record, and if you would have lost this fight, who's to say what would have happened? But a draw at least prolongs it a little bit more. Jahai Tucker's got a lot of skill, a lot of talent. He's gifted in many different parts of his skill set. But man... He's got to put it all together consistently every single fight. Sometimes he's up here. Sometimes he's here. Sometimes he's here. And so sometimes you're just not sure what version you're going to get. But when he is on, man, he's a tough guy to beat. But on this night, it was a great fight, a very great matchup. He really needed to rise to the occasion not to take that L. But I'm not mad at the draw by no means, but I would have given it to Francisco Varane, even if it was by a round. I thought he won the early half of the fight. But nonetheless, a good fight. Uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what both of these men are going to do next. As I tweeted, if you're not following me, follow me on Twitter, at Underdog AKH is going to be on the screen. I said, man, it's, I said, I tweeted, it's going to be interesting to see where Jahai Tucker goes from here. And I said, surely Francisco Veron has earned himself more opportunities in the spotlight. Good fight. Let's move on. Let's go to uh, Bruce Carrington versus Jason Sanchez. Man, I thought this was going to be a closer fight. I thought Carrington would win the fight. I'm, I was thinking unanimous decision. But man, he had something different in mind. I mean, the way how he disguised that punch to land that knockout cleanly, push the left hand with the high guard right next to your face, push that, boom, you bit it, come over with the right and close out the show in a beautifully timed shot. I said, whoa, 
That's it. This man is looking to make a statement. He is looking to prove a point. He is looking to rise to the top in due time. This is a guy who said, hey, man, I think I can give in a way some problems. Right. And if he's going to continue looking like this and developing like this, maybe he can give him some problems in the near future if that fight ever happens. In a way, he's a beast in its whole entirety in itself. But man, Shushu, what he was able to do against a guy who was supposed to be a step up, he just made it look like a regular fight. It was a very impressive win. I don't even have much to say about it other than that. It being an impressive win. Shout out to Shushu, man. You keep doing your thing, man. Beautifully, beautiful, beautiful shot. Let's keep going. Liam Paro versus Montana Love. What did you think about this fight? The comments were going crazy. People were saying to Keem, bro, it's, man, Montana Love is going to wipe the floor with this cat. This cat ain't nothing. I said, yeah, maybe. Obviously, in boxing, any prediction that we do, any video that we do, we're just going off of what we see and what we believe is going to happen in the fight. But until the fight happens, anything is possible. Even fights that are supposed to be easy, you don't know how it's going to unfold. So I just said, OK, and I'm not about to go back and forth. Well, the fight started. Montana Love, man, you know he's 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 fast, right? You know the skills are there, the talent is there. The man's counterpunching ability, you know, is solid across the board. But you just got this feeling that when the pressure was on, man, could he stood that test? And we saw that when he fought Stevie Sparks, right? We know Montana has a lot of skill set, a lot of tools. But for me, there was just something, man, there are some people, man, who talk a big game. There are some people who are able to back it up. And there are some people who are able to back it up when they feel like it. So I think in this position here, man, I think Montana Love looked past Liam Paro and did not give him the respect that he deserves. And it showed. Matter of fact, I tweeted that, right? It just looked like he was expecting, again, when, I, when we did the recap of Stevie Spark, when he fought Stevie Spark, I said... I think he got into the ring and realized that Stevie Spark was a lot better than he anticipated. And I think this was the same case. I thought Montana Love got into the ring and was just like, yo, this man's actually better than I thought because he wasn't hitting him cleanly. Liam Parle was able to move a lot better than Love probably expected. Right, He packed a, 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 a more powerful punch than he expected. He was a little bit more elusive than he expected, a little better footwork than he had expected. It was a 50-50 fight until it wasn't, in my opinion. I said it was a 50-50 fight. If both men are locked in, they have the skill set to neutralize some of the stuff that they can do. But Liam Paro, man, credit to him. He was not intimidated by that man. He was in that ring to not only make a statement, but to dominate the fight. And I thought it was close early, right? I thought both men were trying to figure each other out. Both men were trying to see what each man was going to do. How were they going to respond? How were they going to react? The good thing that Liam Paro did was he did not neglect the jab early. He kept sticking to that jab, jab to the head, jab to the body. And sometimes he would get caught. But then he started to land that left hand. Then he started to land that left hand and that left hand started to land more and more. And he was even simple disguised. Liam Paro shooting that right and boom, followed through with the left. And once he saw that it connected, he's like, let me just try to do it again. And he did it again and he did it again. And you just knew at some point those left hand were going to add up. And then he got caught with that uppercut, that hook. And Montana Love was on the ground on the canvas then after that man it was still early in the fight when you don't have enough time to recover when you're already hurt you know what happens man it was a statement win for liam paro it was a big win for liam paro because some people were saying the knockout in round one against brock jarvis was a bit of a fluke right people were saying he hasn't fought anybody well the man came all the way over from australia 18 19 20 hour flight travel and dominated the fight in this fashion and made a statement against a guy who is quality, who is very skillful in Montana Love. And he made a statement. So I just thought, man, Montana Love, he did not respect Liam Paro, but in the ring, he had no choice but to. 
So I thought it was a great win, man. I mean, it was a big statement win for Liam Poro and how he closed out the show was ju it just goes to show, man, you can't take anybody lightly. And in boxing, even if they don't have a crazy amount of knockouts, you hit somebody with the right shot at the right time. And that could be the shot that takes you out, man. So um, I don't know where Montana Love goes from here, man. He's coming off two back-to-back -back losses now. That messes with you, right? Liam Poro just opened up the window for a lot more opportunities, so hopefully we get to see him at least two, three more times next year, man. I think he's closer to a title shot than a lot of people think. But uh, hats off to him, man. Great win. Great win. Let's move forward. Let's talk about Xander Zayas, Roberto Valenzuela Jr. Now, to be honest, I didn't really see much of this fight. I probably saw a couple rounds, but uh, a lot of people have been hitting me up and asking me about this fight. And I said, man, if Zayas doesn't take this guy out in less than six rounds, something's wrong. And so Zayas took him out in what five? This is what we expect from Xander Zayas, man. The man is skilled. The man is that good. He's that talented, right? He does he does a lot of things really well. And I was expecting a stoppage against Valenzuela. I didn't even do a review of the video because I'm just like, man, Xander Zayas should be able to dominate this fight. And sure enough, he did in a beautiful stoppage win, body shot. So he needs to step it up now, I think. I think he's ready. I think he's ready for those guys in that top 10. I think he is ready. So shout out to Zayas, man. Special kid, man. Special talent. But now it's more than ever. Now we need to see him in those fights to make him say, man, this guy is the one. He's got the skills, got the talent, got the gifts. But now we need to get those fights where we see that test. Hasn't been really tested yet. Right. So we need to see him in those tests moving forward. Now, let's talk about the two headliners. Where do we want to go? Do you want to go Devin Haney? Do you want to go Regis Prograce? Do you want to go Rabezi and Raphael? You know, uh, in the future, next year, we'll be doing the recaps live. But let's go. Uh, let's go Rabezi Ramirez and Rafael Espinosa. Man, that was a fight of the year candidate. Let me get a sip of this coffee real quick. Fight of the year candidate. Wow, wow, wow. When we did a breakdown of that video, man, I said um, about Espinosa, I said just because he doesn't have a crazy name on his resume does not mean he can't rise to the occasion. I made the comparison to him and Shimizu, right? Shimizu was tall, rangy, had some good power, but I said he was older. Right, he was like 36, 37 years old, and Robezi Ramirez dominated and had his way in that fight. But this is a younger version and a bigger puncher than Shimizu, a hungrier guy than Shimizu at this stage in their career. And it was a great back and forth fight early on, man. Round one, two, three, four, kind of looked the same. Robezi was getting outworked. Man, Rafael Espinosa, man, he came to get busy talking about jabs, body shots, hooks, uppercuts. The man was just crazy with the work rate. And as tactical and as skillful as Rabezi Ramirez, if, if you don't allow him room to think, that's going to work in your fav favor. Rabezi needs time, right, to kind of figure how you're going to move. If you give him a little bit of space and distance, he is going to tactically, psychologically find the openings and hit those targets. The man, his amateur record was crazy for a reason, right? He became champion for, for a reason, like this very skilled, very tactical. But if you don't give him time to really think and you just outwork him, it gives you a better opposition, a better position in order to win the fight. And so when the fifth round came in, when Robezi got that knockdown, man, beautifully timed, right hook, floored him right on the corner. Got to be honest, man, if this fight was not in America, that ref would not have allowed him to stood up because Espinosa was out of it. Man, he was using the, the ropes to hold himself up. He could barely move, right? He was feeling it. It was a beautifully timed shot by Robezi. And that's when I thought things were starting to change. And it actually was starting to change, at least for the next couple rounds. Robezi looked like he was starting to find that mark. And there was a good couple rounds where it was Espinosa's heart and will that was keeping him up because Robezi was finding the target cleanly, looping shots, right? Left hand, right hand, body shots. Robezi was starting to really put it on him from round six to seven. 
but he just couldn't put him down. Espinosa just kept coming forward and kept throwing. So even though he was getting hit cleanly by one or two shots, he was still throwing like 10, 12 shots. There was one round where the man like outscored Robesi Ramirez or landed more shots than Robesi by like 50 or 60 punches. That's a crazy amount of work rate. And you have to have a certain level of conditioning to be able to do that. And a man's work rate was the thing that saved them. It was the thing that really made it tough for Robesi because he already had the physical advantages and the physical gifts. Robesi always had to load up a little bit more and punch up. And all Espinosa had to do was step out of the way for a little bit. And boom, he was hitting him at range because he has the reach and he has the length to make it tough. As the fight went on, you could start to see Robesi was starting to get a little bit tired. Both men were a little bit tired, but it takes extra energy to punch up, right? To load up a little bit more than it does for Espinosa because he's used to fighting smaller guys. Last round, man, Oof, both men were going back and forth, bro. It was it was crazy. Heart was on display. Will was on display. Technically, they were both not as sound as they were at the beginning. But, man, you just got the sense that if Robesi was able to stand and not get knocked down, he was going to win that fight. And you got the same feeling from Espinosa. If Espinosa could hang in there, right, not get knocked down, not get too damaged, that he was going to win the fight. And so it was just about heart and will. And in that fight, man, the work rate of Espinosa in that last round, boom, 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 just broke down Robesi Ramirez and he hit the canvas. And once he hit the canvas, you knew we were going to hear and the new. We knew we were going to hear that. At least we don't know until we know. But I had a feeling you probably had that same feeling because you cannot get knocked down in a close fight in the last round because whoever got knocked down in that last round in a close fight, you are going to lose the fight. Rafael Espinosa rose to the occasion on the night and earned himself not only a championship, but the biggest win of his career. Things are about to change for him moving forward. I don't know if he's going to give Robesi a rematch. I would love to see that rematch because this was a fight of the year candidate, but it really goes to show you can never count somebody out just because we have not seen them yet. I've said that a bunch of times about different fighters, man, because, you know, I come from that athletic background and track of field. There are some seasons when you know, you're, you know who's the top dogs. You know who's going to be there. But then every single year, there is somebody in the track and field world that comes and they says, wait a minute, where is where did this cat come from? Why is he running this times? Who is this cat? It happens every year. And sometimes you just need that moment. And for Rafael Espinosa, his moment was December 9th, 2023. He became the champion. Rabezi fought a great fight. He just didn't do enough on the night. But. Nonetheless, I would love to see a rematch. Hats off to Espinosa, man. Shout out to you and your team. Shout out to Robesi as well. Great fight. Fight of the year candidate. And a fight that I would love to see a rematch of. Let's move forward with the last one of the weekend. Dev Mahaney versus Regis Prograce. What do we think? Uh, I don't think anybody should be surprised at the fact that Devin Haney won this fight, right? Let's go back. Shout out to Regis Prograce, man, because he didn't have to take that fight. Um, Post-fight interview, after the fight, he did not say, man, I had an injury, like I had this and that, this and that was bothering me. No, no, no. He stood 10 toes down on the truth. He said, man, this guy was a lot better than I thought. To be honest with you, he was a lot better than I thought. I give him credit for. I tried to get to him, but I just couldn't get to him. I can always respect someone who doesn't make excuses after a loss. Because when you lose, man, it affects your heart. It affects your pride, you know, and you kind of look for something to say 
why it didn't go your way, or you're trying to find certain reasons, right? It's just human nature. But Pro Graves did not have a reason. He just wasn't the man on the night. He lost the fight. In the fight, man, it was just one of those ones where I thought two things happened that fight, man. I honestly don't think Regis Pro Graves' corner gave him the best advice throughout the fight i'm not in their camp i'm sure all of those individuals are great trainers you're great at what you do this is not a critique by no means right i'm not in your position i'm not a trainer but to me they didn't really give them hey man like this is what you have to do this is what we're seeing man this is what you got to try right i just didn't hear that i didn't see it and you need to be able to make adjustments in real time against a guy like Devin Haney who makes adjustments in real time. That's why him and Lomachenko was such a great fight because Lomachenko's corner was saying, yo, this isn't working. This is what you have to do. And Loma is smart enough to know, look, this is what I have to do right now. Pro Grays just didn't have that, right? These trainers did not really tell him this is what you need to make the adjustments by. And Pro Grays is all heart, all will. You know, he's got that left hand. You know, he's got that power, but he didn't even throw that. Like Devin Haney took away that strength, right? Devin Haney, as I said, when we break down the video, he is so disciplined to the game plan. They're always going to have a great game plan. It's one of their strengths. It's one of the reasons why they've been able to be so successful because he's so disciplined in the game plan that, man, he just took away anything that Regis was trying to do or was able to do. I would have liked to see Regis just throw that left hand a little bit more, even if you got clipped earlier in the fight. I was waiting for him like, man, Regis, man, show him that left. Man, show him that right, show him that power just to see what it was going to do, just to shake him up a little bit, just to scare him a little bit. Even if it hit the shoulder, let him feel it. But he didn't let him feel it, man. He did not let him feel it. He wasn't as aggressive as I would have liked him to have been. He tried to do it in the last couple of rounds, but it was too late. He couldn't cut off the ring well enough. We knew that was a problem of Regis Progress. As I said, when we're breaking down the video, he doesn't do the greatest job at that. He doesn't do the best against movers, right? But at the same time, it was a little worse than I was thinking that he was going to do. And I credit that not to what he did, but because of all the things that Devin Haney was doing. Devin Haney fought like how he usually does, but... This version of Devin Haney was two notches better than I've ever seen him be before ever in any boxing ring. He was a way better version than when he fought Lomachenko, a way better version than when he fought George Cambosis. This version of Devin Haney was the best that I have ever seen him. The knockdown. It's not that, you know, a lot of people always talk about he has pillow fists, and I never really bought too much into that, man, uh, because... You know, they said the same thing about Floyd, but you see some of some of Floyd's opponents and their faces were kind of, you know, a little busted up a little bit. It's the accuracy, the precision, the timing of Devin Haney, why he was able to get that knockdown against Regis Progress, why he was able to stumble Regis Progress. He doesn't have that one shot knockout type of power. I don't think Devin Haney will ever have that, but he's able to make that power a little bit more juicier because of his accuracy, because of his timing. When he caught Prograis, it was beautiful. Prograis, he was already used a little bit of that momentum trying to land the shot. And when he put that hand was in front of him, boom, Haney caught him beautifully and he dropped him. That's when I was just like, yeah, it's going to be a long night for Regis Prograis. <laughs> it's going to be a long night for Prograis, man. Um, you can't say nothing bad about Devin Haney in that performance. Everything that he done, man, it was a dang near perfect fight. Obviously, there is no such thing as a perfect fight, but there are things that can get close to it, and that was one of them. That was a statement win against a quality guy in Regis Prograis. Yeah, Prograis looked a little bit slower to me. Uh, Prograis looked a little bit confused inside of the ring because he just didn't know what to do. And I don't think his trainers really knew what to do. They knew he was losing, but they weren't telling him anything to get back into the fight. And that's a problem because you're leaving someone who needs some cues in order to help figure it out because he didn't know how to figure it out. So where is he going to find that key to that puzzle 
if he's not getting it from the people around him, man. So it was just a beautiful fight from Devin Haney. Uh, Devin Haney beat him in every single category possible. And it was a great fight. Like, I don't really have too much else to say about it, man. It was a great fight. And it's a fight that makes people probably want to stay away from Devin Haney now. It makes, man, 140 is such an exciting division now, man. There's talks about him and Sabriel Matias. Love to see that. Talks about him and Teofima Lopez. I'd love to see that. It's a great time. It's a great time in the 140-pound division. Now, what does Regis Progress do next? Progress, I don't know if you'll ever watch this, man, but I got respect for you nonetheless. Win, lose, or draw, I got respect for you nonetheless because you didn't make an excuse. You showed your heart. Even though you were losing the fight, you got back up and kept fighting and kept trying to find a way, even though you, you were outclassed that fight, right? It happens. It's boxing. Things happen. But he needs to get back into the ring as soon as possible, man. He doesn't need to take too much time off because you take too much time off. You're going to get into your head. You're going to think, man, like, am I not good enough? This and that. No, no, no. You need to get back into the ring when you're recovered. Spend time with the family. Rejuvenate yourself. Get your mind right. Get the body right. And get back into the ring. Maybe March or April, man. We got to see you. Even if, Maybe it's against Liam Paro. Right. Maybe it's it's for another title shot with somebody else. We just need to see you because your story isn't over, man. So please hang in there. Devin Haney now is next. He say he might go to 147. If that's the case, he, you know, he wants to fight Boots, you know, Gerard Ennis Boots. That's a hey, if that happens, that happens, man. One thing about Devin Haney that you got to respect is. He is not afraid of those big fights and he wants those big fights and he is going to try to make those big fights happen. So hats off to Haney, man. Hats out to every single fighter that was in the ring this weekend, man. I hope that win, lose, or draw, I hope that you guys got your finances secured. I hope you got the money to rejuvenate yourself to take care of your family, man, because it's a dangerous, dangerous sport that you're doing. So hats off to all of you, man. It was a great weekend of boxing. What were your thoughts on this fight? What did you think about it? Who would you like to see any of those guys fight next? What was the highlight of the weekend for you? Let me know in the comment section below.